welcome to all our participants from around the world. It's great that people are sh sharing in the chat where they're from, uh, so that we can see who is who's represented here today. We will come back to your remarks and questions after we've uh, heard our expert presentations, which we will continue to now. We are so fortunate as to have uh, four uh, distinguished speakers with us here today. And we will hear from different perspectives, both from uh, people who are closely involved in the Paris Agreement uh, negotiations uh, and uh, at UN level in activities around climate change and from practitioners in parliaments who are themselves part of uh, the uh, current uh, discussions around parliamentary action for climate change and also from uh, representative from academia. So we are going to have a treat um, here today. So uh, with no further ado, I would like to pass the floor to our first um, panelist, um, Mr. Luis Alfonso de Alba, a Mexican diplomat for decades, but also, and particularly with uh, regards to today's topic, um, Mr. De Alba was uh, the special envoy of the United Nations Secretary General for the uh, 2019 Climate Summit. So uh, Ambassador De Alba, we are so pleased to have you with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christine. Uh, let me uh, let me start by, by recognizing how well the discussion has been framed by Professor Sachs and, and Gabriela Cuevas. And I, I would like to concentrate and focus on the preparation of COP26. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Oh, sorry. I lost the, the, the image. Uh, as I was saying, I think preparation for COP26 is quite important. And even though I fully agree with what uh, has been said so far, I think it is important for parliamentarians to, to recognize not only that uh, the level of commitment until today shown by the, the national determined contribution is still very low, but there are also countries which may not reach the, the commitments or may, may not uh, comply with, uh, with the commitment they have made in Paris. And in any case, we will need a level of commitment that will need to be multiplied at least by three, four times from the level that it was expressed in Paris. So the, the urgency of action in regard to the, to the NDCs is much higher than, than we expected. We have lost one year because of the pandemic and certainly we have seen through the uh, period, uh, especially after the, the summit in 2019, that uh, action is coming mainly by the private sector and other stakeholders, uh, local governments, etc. But national governments are lagging behind. And therefore, I would say that the first priority in COP26 for parliamentarians would be to find a way to put pressure on governments. And there are many ways of doing that, but the, the, the most effective one, I would say, is to interact with the governments in, uh, the, during the COP itself and in preparing for the COP, obviously, in preparing for the COP at the national level and in Glasgow by interacting with all governments. Governments need to feel the pressure because, uh, as I was saying, some are not uh, showing very good results, some are even backtracking. And uh, the second point I wanted to make is uh, in relation to the COP itself. You need to be aware that the process is, is in a bad, very bad shape. It's one of the worst negotiating exercises within the UN. I've been saying this uh, for the last 10, 12 years since uh, Copenhagen, Cancun, Paris, because the, the system has shown very little flexibility to reflect the urgency and the gravity of, uh, of the problem when it comes to negotiations. Uh, they follow some understandings because they are not formally rules that allow every single delegation to block uh, and to obstruct uh, a decision. And therefore, a number of exercises, a number of alliances and, and groups have uh, risen uh, and, and they are developing a, a strategy to put pressure into the, into the process. I think parliamentarians should do the same. They should understand that many 
uh, of the, the things that are going to be relevant at the COP, uh, the, the main contributions that can be brought to the COP will need to be worked out with uh, countries and, 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 and parliamentarians from countries that share the same values and work in a parallel manner uh, to a large extent. If you just wait for Glasgow to, to try to build understandings, it would be too late. Uh, it's it's going to be, uh, as it has been the case in, in Madrid, uh, a process on which you will see many uh, actors uh, engage fully into the process, uh, actors from different constituencies, uh, women, indigenous groups, uh, youth, etc. And you may be, as we were in, in Madrid, disappointed uh, with the end result, only because a group of countries block a particular point in the negotiation. In, in Madrid, it was the case with the negotiations of Article 6. And we lost the, the impetus that we have gained uh, at the summit in 2019 to a large extent. Uh, we need to avoid that in Glasgow. We, we cannot ignore the importance of uh, those negotiations, particularly those pending negotiations. Uh, but at the same time, we need to, to find ways of uh, solving those problems outside of the meeting rooms. Building coalitions of the willing has been a problem for many uh, member states uh, until today, but it has worked. And I think there is no other solution unless we change the, the, the way the COPs uh, work, but it will take a, a huge effort and, and I don't see the, the the willingness neither within the secretariat, uh, uh, the, the, the level uh, at the highest level uh, to do that, nor at the at the governmental side. So there is a big challenge uh, to do that. Let me also highlight something which is quite important in terms of having uh, uh, an influence into the decision making process during the COP itself which is to choose very carefully uh, how parliamentarians want to, uh, to be accredited uh, to the COP. There are two ways. One of them is as parliamentarians, why is one of the constituencies that has been recognized and is well organized, but it will have a, 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 a consultative or a, a, a observer status uh, with that kind of accreditation, parliamentarians will not be able to participate in many meetings. The second way, which I will recommend very much also to some parliamentarians, not necessarily all, is to be part of their national delegations. By being part of those delegations, you will have access to all meetings and you will have the possibility also to participate in internal meetings of the delegations on which you can see with more precision and clarity. What are the challenges? What are the, the obstacles? What are the countries or the negotiators? Because sometimes it's not only the country, it's the person which is uh, blocking uh, uh, an understanding or a decision on a particular issue. Let me also uh, end with, uh, with a comment in terms of what uh, is going to be needed from uh, other actors in terms of uh, uh, arriving to a successful uh, outcome, not only at the COP26, but uh, as it was mentioned, to, to, to reach the level of ambition that we all want by 2030 and certainly by 2050. We need to understand that every day the action by other stakeholders, not only national governments, is very, very important. And I would like to highlight uh, the importance of local governments, and particularly if we are talking about parliamentarians, and we know that there are many local parliamentarians also working, I think it would be important uh, to extend the invitation to participate into this process to those local authorities. In many countries, and it is the case in my own country, uh, local authorities are taking the lead in the fight against climate change, and are showing by action their commitment, not, not only by, by speeches, uh, not only by uh, general commitments, uh, and, and therefore it is important. It is also important to take into account the specific contribution that other constituencies 
particularly from civil society and, and cert certainly also by the private sector can, can make both at the national, regional and, and global level. It's the only way that we will be able to, to achieve. I would be very happy to, to get into more details while, uh, once we enter into the discussion and particularly about the challenges of this process that I already characterized as, as one of the worst within the UN. And I'm talking about 40 years of experience participating in multilateral meetings and climate negotiations are really in a very bad shape. We, we will need to talk more about that uh, later. It's probably not the time today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador de Alba, for your insightful remarks and also uh, to, for being frank about how the process is and how parliamentarians can uh, perhaps uh, be, be more actively involved. I think this is the question here, how we can have a parliamentary track at COP26 that is actually meaningful for parliamentarians to participate in and how they can uh, also uh, work uh, going up to the COP and be an active part of the preparation. So thank you so much for your insights. Um, and uh, as Ambassador de Alba mentioned, we will come back uh, also to our panelists at the end. So if you have questions, please make sure to either put them in the chat or raise your hand once we get to the Q&A session. Uh, so do take note of the questions that you have for our panelists as we go along. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And um, it is now my great pleasure to uh, introduce our next uh, panelist, um, Ms. Lawrence Tubiana, who is uh, currently serving as the CEO of European Climate Foundation. But before joining the ECF, um, Ms. Tubiana was the climate change ambassador for France. And uh, particularly uh, involved in the Paris Agreement negotiations, the special representative for COP21. Um, so um, Ms. Tubiana has a lot of uh, insights around uh, the Paris uh, negotiations. And um, Ms. Tubiana, we're very pleased to have you with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you for the invitation and for the great speeches that I've been listening carefully. Uh, I'm very happy to have that discussion with all of you as I am advising the British government to prepare COP26 and trying to draw the lessons of how we succeed in Paris and, and the, the ways we did it and how this can be used in COP26. But there, and, and <clears throat> but there is first maybe a big difference in this COP and in the future for all conference of the parties. Uh, until then, and Paris was, was of course a landmark, the issue was to agree on a collective commitment to reduce emission. And if you read carefully and correctly Paris Agreement, it's no more about incremental changes like it was in 1997 and the Kyoto Protocol or even before uh, at the origin of the convention uh, of the UNFCCC. So <clears throat> Paris was about everyone acting to reduce emission consistent with the global goal, which meant to stay well below two degrees C and protecting the capacity to limit temperature at 1.5 degree compared to pre-industrial temperature. That was of course to be net zero emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050 or soon after. So now COP26 is five years after Paris, uh, is a moment of implementation. In Paris, it was clear that on one side, we had to decide on the agreement itself and its rules and its mechanisms. <clears throat> and on the other side, that was a moment before Paris Agreement actually to, for, for all countries to present climate plans. And we knew at that time that the climate plans were not enough presented before uh, the, the beginning of the conference uh, of COP21. So the mechanism in Paris was anyway in these next five years because of the, the <clears throat> agreement of Paris uh, is uh, enforced and put into place in 2020. That was the decision until then there was of course other processes in place. But starting from 2020, the countries has to revise their climate plan which were intended in 2015 and now has to be uh, the formal and the formal commitment that countries have to take. 
And that's why, <clears throat> why it was so just to use these five years in a way to make countries more working on that because most of the climate plans presented in 2015 were not really uh, worked very well. It was not a whole government effort most of the time uh, connected to main, mainly the Minister of Environment and there was no clear pathways. So the, the challenge for COP26, again, it's not more a negotiation. There are some elements still to negotiate, but they are very, very little. But it is a COP about implementation. And that's why I think there is good chances now to have these processes focused on the implementation of this deep decarbonization, the deep reduction of greenhouse gases that uh, Jeffrey Sachs was mentioning, mentioning that finally, even if everyone has to define its own development pathway, well, there are a number of things that ev every country has to to in a way execute, and in particular, dropping the use of fossil fuel, coal or oil, and even gas very soon, vis-a-vis -vis and in favor of other zero carbon sources of energy. If it's, uh, so COP26 and that the trick has to revise this climate plan that this uh, national determined contribution, the, the, formal, the formal commitments uh, but for 2030 first, and for the moment, there is no direct link between these commitments and the global goal of Paris. So these commitments for 2030 are typically bottom up, meaning the expression of countries' decision, but they are not linked to the, and consistent with the temperature we, we are aiming to maintain. And that's why there is a, a progress to be made at COP26 if we are ambitious enough is not only to ask countries to increase their indices, but to consider seriously, and before 2023, where we will do a, a wrap up of all the efforts and try to aggregate them, and that what we call the global stock take, uh, every country should look at its own contribution from 2030 and ask uh, if finally they are consistent with the global goal. And of course, most of them, some of them are now more or less consistent I think about, for example, the EU emission reduction target of minus 55% by 2030 was just, but not overly, but just enough to reach net zero emission by 2050, which is a commitment that the European Union has taken as well. So maybe the challenge for COP26, if I may say so, is of course to get these countries, to all countries to present more ambitious climate plans for 2030. Uh, committing to long-term strategies that are consistent with Paris goal, meaning aiming at net zero by 2050 or soon after. But in a way, writing in the text, in the decision, they have to, in a way, negotiate that it is an individual commitment. It's not only an, aggreg an aggregated one, it's an individual one. And that's important because, again, from COP26 onwards, the, the mechanism of these COPs will be about peer pressure it will be about tracking, it will be about really speaking the truth and not in a way greenwashing. And again, sharing experiences, of course, and trying to really bring supports to each other, but with a, a, a demand and a seriousness into the implementation. So in my view, the first thing for parliamentarians is to consider that you are a body in each of our country or, or your countries and together as a, in a way, uh, consciousness, a uh, testimony of how real these efforts are, how serious they are. So that's the first, the monitoring and, and in a way the, the guardian of the spirit of Paris uh, should be one of your role in my view. And of course, trying to get in COP26, not only general commitments on the NDCs, but insist on the consistency with the global goal we are pursuing, because again, we are late into really implementing. The second element is your relation of all of you with your own societies. And all this deep transformation is about a huge transformation in the way we live, in the way we feed ourselves, in the way we use land, in the way uh, we, we change, we, we make all this economy, which was essentially based on fossil fuels since now more than two centuries, 
uh, move into this transition. And this transition, of course, has a lot of uh, impacts, economic impacts, uh, some negative, some very, very positive. Overall, anyway, positive because in the long term, there is no possibility of economic growth uh, with climate change. But at the same time, as well, social impact because the people, the, the territories were highly dependent on the job of the fossil fuel industry or connected to, uh, has to transit to other activities. And this is about how the social compact, the social contract, is operated in every country, but to allow this social contract to embed in that, that we have to pursue social justice at the same time as ecological transition. And this is something where nobody knows exactly how to do it, but there is a concern for every country, whatever culture development in a way thinking is there. The third element where I see an enormous role for the parliamentarian beyond, again, trying to bridge this question of social justice together with um, uh, ecological transition beyond these oversight activities I was mentioning in the beginning is a way to connect with citizen and empower citizen. You are, whatever the regime you are working in and the constraint, you, are the, you speak the language of democracy and, and people representation. The people who have delegated their sovereignty, their power to you, you are accountable, of course, in front of them. But at the same time, you understand that the future of democracies in a moment where the social transformation will is and will be very, very deep and important has to embark citizen. So the agency, the power of citizen is key to develop this ecological transition with the social justice at the same time. And empowering citizen is a way to work on the mechanism where democracies are working in. And how finally the voices of citizens, whether they, it's on the, on the role of consumers, the way they can pressure on governments, where they express their preferences or innovate in their own, in their own power. But that is a way as current violence, you can, you can defend that capacity of citizen to get old. I've been participating to a fascinating experience in France, chairing the Citizen Assembly for Climate Change, where 100 citizen, 150 citizens have worked during more than a year to propose a major law to, to, to really be able for the French economy to reach this minus 40% of emission reduction, which was the initial commitment of France in 2015. Citizen can express willingness to change that seems much deeper than normally the government would, would dare to. And that, again, is a story of ambition, showing vision, showing a collective endeavor. And that's why in your political role, which is your central role, it's really important to not only uh, combat vested interests that would block this transformation, but help make space in your own countries to the voice of citizen. And finally, again, try to understand the potential contradiction and trade-off between all these objectives. And of course, when we add else and all the SDGs, we have a number of objectives that has to be articulated together and not you cannot implement easily all at the same time. So I would say, and, and we really recommend that you play this full role of discussion, the social contract around, uh, around ecological transition and in my view, in COP26, if these voices of people are heard and your voice is heard, I think we will be on much better track than a, only a bureaucratic uh, discussion uh, within the new FCCC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Tubiani. And for your last point, I couldn't agree more. And, and thank you for pointing out sort of the dual or triple role of parliamentarians, but definitely as uh, the link to citizens and the voice of citizens and the responsibility that uh, each parliamentarian uh, carries as that link between the very global agenda and the local um, livelihoods of, of citizens. So incredibly important there. Thank you so much for your remarks. And I hope uh, you all took note of uh, questions to Ms. Tobiana, we'll return to that. Um, Moving on to our next uh, panelist, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce my uh, dear colleague from the Danish parliament, Mr. Rasmus Norqvist, 
who is uh, to me known as a true champion of climate action and will give us the perspective uh, from the floor of the parliament uh, as an example of um, from someone who has participated in climate negotiations, both on a national level and an international level for, for years. Rasmus, it is a great pleasure to uh, welcome you and um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Kirsten, and thank you to, to, to all the organizers and, and the very inspiring speak, uh, speakers uh, who came before me. Um, I'm very happy to be able to, to, to talk here today, and, and, and I will touch two things. First of all, I will talk a bit about the, the climate law we, we adapted in Denmark last year um and how the role of, of parliamentarians is within this law and secondly of course uh, how to 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 participate at, and 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 work at the cop uh, meetings um last year in denmark we passed uh, a, a new climate law first of all an important law which has a, a 70 percent reduction target in in 2030 uh, I think that was a, a, a huge uh, success that we got that into the law, a law that was uh, adopted with, with, with great majority, almost all parties in parliament actually participated in negotiating and, and, and voting through this law. But, but what was actually the most important part of this law, as I see it, is the whole programming we put into the law, that we actually... Uh, made a yearly plan for climate policy in Denmark. This means that the government every year in autumn has to come up with a new climate program showing the way towards the 70% reduction target in, in 2030. That every law we have to pay every year uh, on this, uh, based on this program, we have discussion in parliament where we can all, all be heard and, and come in with inputs to the program. But also we, we, we established with this law, uh, independent climate council, which then takes the program, analyze it and come up with their uh, uh, view on it, whether it's, it's enough action or not. Uh, after this, then the parliamentarians again can come, come, come in the process and say, okay, we could hear from the climate council that 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 the action from the government is not enough to to clearly show the way to the 70 percent uh, reduction targets in in 2030 so we call upon the government with 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 the, the the need to do more action so so what we established with this law was actually forcing the government into having a year-round discussion with parliament and not just working in their own uh, offices on climate policy, it also, of course, ask of us to 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 engage in this and come up with solutions and not just not just do the scrutiny and and, and the questions, but actually come up with solutions into how to to meet our targets. The second part of of of, uh, of the law was was about the engagement of, of civil society and citizens. And, and as Ms. Uh, Tubiano was saying, this is as important if we have to, 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 to meet the targets and, and do the work we need to do. So, so we established a citizen assembly with great inspiration from France in, in our climate law. Uh, the assembly is working right now. Uh, of course, it was a bit delayed because of the COVID-19, but they're working now online in a process to also come up with solutions that we can we can take forward. And then we established a network of civil society organizations that can also all the time be in, 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 in a relationship both with government, but also uh, with the committee in parliament. Um, it was not an easy process to do this law because of course governments never really like to, to, to have written so much in words that the, the engagement of parliamentarians in the work. But I think it was a very, very important step we took because it, it first of all, it, 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 it makes us all uh, active in the processes that, that, that need to be, be, be taken and the steps that need to be taken. Um, and it's also a work. I mean, we, we were forcing ourselves into to, to being active on all levels, both in, 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 in uh, 
in in uh, conversations with 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 citizens, uh, our constituents, but also civil society, but also on an international level. And uh, and uh, I think I will 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 spend the last of my minutes to speak to 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 focus on that how I work with with the COP. Uh, meetings and how I get involved in that. First of all, I think it was an important point that came earlier to 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 get a seat in the delegations, be part of the delegations because you have access. And it's it's all about access to meet the right people, talk to the right people during the COPs. I have seen that it has been quite important, both with, with the current government and the government before that, uh, that, that actually the parliamentarians can often pl play a role in getting the contacts to to international civil society organizations, parliamentarians from other countries, and so forth, and take this feedback back to our uh, uh, government and the delegations negotiating um, in the meetings. And actually, the government quite often have been quite happy about the role we can play there. But the second is to really get into the process of what is being discussed, and follow up on that when we can come home from from the meetings. And especially, I would I would uh, point out that after Katowice, where we had some important discussions, especially on Article 9.5, uh, we have been following up in Parliament closely with the government on how are we actually meeting these these new uh, uh, decisions that was made. And I think that is as important. One thing is the meetings we're doing and meeting up internationally, but follow up. And I think. That, that parliamentarians have a, a specific role here because we are the ones who are doing the parliamentary scrutiny. We are the ones who can ask questions to the government and they have to answer us. And we need to take every decision made at the COP, also the COP26, and go back and follow up in the years to come with our governments. Are they meeting these targets we set? Are they actually following uh, um, the rules and decision that was made on, 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 on UN level? So, 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 I think my my most important point here, both with the Danish climate law and with with the COP meetings, is it's about active participations. I mean, to to just think you can you can lean back and sit at meetings, it's not an option. If we have to meet the climate crisis and have to to fight it, it needs to be done in active work, and that's also from 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 our our side. And and uh, and we only do that by 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 forcing the governments to 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 involve us in this work, so we can involve the rest of society. I think that should be my my opening remarks, uh, Kirsten, and then I look forward also to to uh, to the discussion afterwards. Thank you, dear Rasmus. Um, great to hear both your perspectives, uh, practical experience from the COPs and how you can work there uh, in a useful way. And particularly, of course, the follow up and your role as um, parliamentary oversight scrutiny, uh, incredibly important uh, experience there. So thank you for sharing that. And um, we ha have one more panelist before we open the floor to questions and comments. Um, I am very pleased to welcome uh, David Smith, who is our last panelist and who is the coordinator of the Institute for Sustainable Development and director of the Center for Environmental Management um, at the University of the West Indies. Um, Mr. Smith, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kirsten. And uh, welcome to everybody, uh, to all the parliamentarians and the experts who are gathered. I'd like to emphasize a couple of points which I think would be very important leading up to and for COP itself. Uh, one of them is the importance of differences. Very often we hear about climate change being expressed as a rise of a certain level of degrees by a certain number of years, and it's always expressed as a average. This tends to hide some of the inequalities that exist. And I think it's very important for parliamentarians to pay attention to some of those inequalities. We heard at the beginning about the inequalities of the way in which climate, for example, may affect women or marginalized communities, the poor, and so on. And I think it's going to become more and more important to recognize those differences not only within countries, but also between countries as well. And that parliamentarians should be talking to each other, but 
also not just to raise the concerns about inequity between the way in which different countries might be affected, but also the way in which their constituents might be affected vis-a-vis -vis the constituents of other people within their own country. And this is, I think, key because as somebody who lives in a small island developing state, one of the concerns is that many of the small island states will be affected earlier and in some cases one could argue more severely than other states. Definitely we need to pay attention to some of the scientific work which shows that countries particularly in the tropical belt will likely be affected by climate change much more quickly than countries which are further away from the equator. And that means then that when we are debating how to reach targets and the way in which targets should be met, it's very important to understand those differences and that the urgency of some countries may be much, much more on the uh, close to the edge than other countries. To do that, I think it's important to form alliances and the, the SIDS have done this very well in terms of AOSIS, for example, um, and the association of, that's the Association of Small Island States. Uh, finding other alliances is going to become increasingly important. And so finding alliances within countries with other, with NGOs, for example, might be key, but also finding alliances between countries to be able to push for some of the more ambitious targets. And so, for example, we, we know that there is the, the, the desire to keep emissions up no more than two degrees above historical limits, but there is a real need to keep, for many countries, the limit to 1.5 degrees because of these differentiated effects on different countries. While a large continental country may be able to absorb a 1.5 degree change in temperature, it's very likely that many of the small island states will not. And so the, they need to, in a sense, fight harder and also to find allies to help them in that fight. We've heard a lot about uh, how to set and move towards the different levels of ambition that have been uh, discussed. I think that's incredibly important, but as well to find ways of ensuring that there are good organic links between government and academia and making sure that the policies that are set at the national level, at the regional level, within countries and between countries are based on good quality science. And here I think uh, parliamentarians should definitely try to uh, liaise with academia as much as possible, make sure that they have good channels of information in both directions. Academics very often do need to hear from government in terms of what are the problems you would like us to solve or would like us to face. Sometimes we may be solving something that's very interesting, but not by be as relevant to a parliamentarian as you would like, but it requires a flow of information from the parliamentarians, I think, to academia to help us to understand what are the key things that you find most important. One of the issues I think will be coming up more and more has to do with if it is that developed countries are going to be changing infrastructure and transportation systems and so on, does that mean that the redundant or old pieces of transportation systems or old cars that run on internal combustion engines will find their way to developing countries? Um, I'm very concerned and I think many of our developing country parliamentarians ought to become concerned about the real possibility of dumping um, either obsolete or soon to become obsolete infrastructure and equipment from developed countries into developing countries. We've seen that happen in the past when emission standards have been changed for automobiles. All of a sudden uh, we see uh, reconditioned secondhand cars becoming available in 
uh, tropical countries. We want to be sure that that sort of thing does not happen as a result of the very good ambitions to uh, change uh, the way in which energy is generated and used in the developed countries, but we also want to make sure that we are not simply moving obsolete technology to the south and in the end, possibly increasing the inequalities and also not really addressing the overall problem. Um, the only other thing is let's make sure we focus on damage and loss as well. It seems to keep falling off the table and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith, also for giving us uh, that incredibly important uh, perspective from the small island states and uh, the fact that consequences are not evenly distributed of climate change. So we really need to take that perspective into account and also for pointing to the science policy nexus, which is actually uh, something that um, we at Parliamentarians for the Global Goals are, are currently discussing with the, the um, um, the global network, the sustainable development solutions network on how we can work together to strengthen that uh, nexus. So thank you for pointing out uh, that as well.